Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The group of women from Galilee had loyally followed Jesus, uh, loyal enough even to watch his cruel death. They had watched where Jesus' corpse had been buried. But upon coming to the tomb Sunday morning, they found it empty with a large stone rolled away. Now these women had had a very tough weekend, to put it mildly. They were frazzled and frightened, and the tomb guards only made it worse. But these men were actually servants not of Rome, but of Yahweh. They spoke to the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? Well, they certainly hadn't understood it all before, but now at least these women began to. And some of the women, the, the women rushed back and some of them were told, told the apostles. They told them what they had seen and heard. But Luke tells us the account of the women seemed like an idle tale to the disciples. What is an idle tale? Well, it's a tale that's too good to be true. An idle tale eh, doesn't really change anything about life. An idle tale is of no real comfort to someone who has lost a loved one. No matter how good a story or moving, a story cannot fix death. Now, stories can help us cope. Every religion tries to help us deal with death by providing stories. Story, stories from every corner and culture of the globe try to help us deal with loss and hurt. These stories try to defend what life we have because death threatens to invade and take away purpose and joy, even when we're not dead yet. When death stares us in the face, idle tales will not really change anything. I suspect that's what half the people who hear my funeral sermons or maybe my Easter sermons are thinking. They don't want to hear idle tales about some guy or about heaven or about fairy tales. At funerals, I can see it sometimes quite clearly painted on patiently polite faces, faces that are frustrated and angry, or faces that are numbed and deeply distressed. The story of Easter is simply that to many people, an idle tale. It doesn't really change anything. You do your thing, pastor, the faces tell me, but it is your thing not mine. I get it. They're right. No story is going to fix death. Not even the Easter story. Or maybe I should say not even Easter when it's only a story. But the women weren't trying to tell a story. The women were pointing to a new Christ-wrought reality. They were trying to get those sad and stubborn disciples to get their mopey butts to the tomb to begin to see for themselves. The stone was gone. The guards were gone. The body of Jesus was gone. Because you won't find Jesus in a tomb, but you might find him living in us. The angels asked, why are you looking for the living among the dead. Sometimes organized Christianity has allowed Easter to be only a story. We treat Jesus, sometimes all of us in different ways, we treat Jesus as if he was a relic. Someone we honor, not someone we follow or speak with or listen to. Tucked back into a safe and unobtrusive Bible, 
or contained in the dusty confines of a Gothic sanctuary, or on an act, an act on a stage with actors and musicians left behind when we go home. A traditional figure that ranks somewhere between Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. But the apostles, at this point, they weren't ready to play pretend because the pain was too real for them. They thought it was an idle tale. But they were dead wrong because Jesus wasn't dead at all. You see, following Christ, it's not a matter of simply believing a story. No matter how amazing, no matter how true the story is. No, it's living a new christ wrought reality. You might say it starts with the story, but you might as well just say it starts with a relationship with Christ. Speaking to Jesus. Learning from him and receiving from him. Jesus had come to restore. That's what he came to this world to do, to bring peace and forgiveness and to turn people away from nasty and broken and tired ways of living. But the world couldn't handle it. Jesus' own followers couldn't hack it. Jesus was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends. The religious leaders, they wouldn't admit that they were wrong. Jesus was prosecuted due to the pride, lust, and jealousy of the religious establishment. And the government couldn't tolerate the changes Jesus brought. Jesus was executed by the so-called self-styled world government of Rome. The disciples were in deep despair, partly because of their own failings. They felt like losers and probably turncoats. But Jesus appeared to them, shocking, and, and eventually we read later in Luke's gospel, convincing them that he was alive. Later in Luke, Jesus was insistent that they physically grabbed onto him and shared food with them because Jesus was not a ghost. He wasn't a spirit. He was a physical human being alive who had been dead. He opened their minds to the Old Testament scriptures that were pointing out that this was what God had been planning ever since death had arrived. Easter is no idle tale. And we could say that in a couple of ways. Easter is no idle tale because it's not a vain hope. It's not a lie we tell ourselves. The story points us back to the Savior of Israel who can be, who is witnessed throughout the Old and New Testament. It points us to the, the one true God of Israel who rescued Israel from slavery and gave them a new identity. It's the perfect culmination of God's primary message seen throughout the scriptures. Repent and trust in God's plan instead of your plan or the world's plan. And it's, it's not, as some people accuse Christianity or religion of being, it's not a self-serving religion because it teaches us to put others first. It doesn't pretend that the world is all hunky-dory. It admits that we are imperfect. And yet it tells us that we are created, valued, and redeemed by God. Lastly, Easter is no idle tale either. It's not a do-nothing, changes-nothing story. Back to business as normal now. If the gospel of Jesus grabs hold of you, you won't be able to sit still. The early church sure didn't. It wasn't a, oh cool, Jesus rose from, the, from death and now I get to go to heaven. No, you see it in their lives. You see, if you really believe the Easter story, it's something you live. Read the book of Acts. I mean, they gave up their possessions. They broke bread with people who they'd, they'd avoided like the plague their whole lives. Some turned their life savings over to the apostles. The apostles, for their part, joyfully endured imprisonment, pain, and even death because nothing, I mean nothing, could dampen their joy after Jesus' resurrection victory. The gospel is no idle tale for you or me either. Easter does not simply mean we have an eternal insurance policy. Easter can't possibly be an idle tale for Christians because after Easter sinks in, we can't possibly stay idle any longer. Our Lord is living. 
And he's living and working through his church, through you and me, if we dare to allow him to. So we dare to let the words of Jesus affect such things as who we sleep with, who we speak with, and who we eat with. We dare to let the words of Jesus erase our enemies, risk, possessions, and popularity. We dare to share instead of hissing and clawing to keep it all to ourselves. We dare to suffer instead of fighting back so that the gospel of the suffering yet victorious Savior might be made abundantly clear in our lives. And if you haven't dared to do those things, well, with Jesus' help, you can. You see, we have a new top priority. It's more important than money or pleasure or family or country. The most valuable thing we could ever hope for is a gift that our Lord has given us and made possible through Jesus' death and resurrection. We are called to live as if Jesus and the community of Christ is what matters most. We're called to live as if the community of Jesus and the community of Christ is what matters most because it is what matters most. Now, if you're um, not a, a regular attender at Grace, I don't want to pretend as if we've already arrived. We don't have it all together yet. We're, we're not perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. Um, we don't always speak and act as we should. But we are following Christ. And if the gospel of Jesus has grabbed you, I'm, I'm not worried. You just can't go back to life as it was. So I encourage you, whatever stage you're in, whatever state of life your faith is in, to allow Christ to continue to transform your life. Allow him into your life. And I invite you to join us. Talk to us and talk to me. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people here on, on Easter, but to me, it's, I, I feel like my strengths are more like personal conversations or Bible study. I'd rather have big old crowds at, at those things. I invite you, if you have questions, please contact me. I would love to hear or talk with you. Come with me, come with us at Grace as we imperfectly follow a perfect Savior whose love for you and me is perfect, even though we aren't. Because Easter is more than an idle story. It's an invitation for you and me to walk with Jesus in a new way of life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.